Good morning, everybody. Welcome once again to Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Thank you to everyone who's come in person. Thank you to everyone on Zoom, but we ask that you continue to try to come in person because it's very, it's really wonderful to see everyone together and get to know each other and uh, support our speakers. So today we have an excellent talk on type one diabetes. And before we get started, we'll have a Samantha Adamson from the Department of Endocrinology give us a, a brief overview. Thank you. Welcome everyone to the 20th Julio V. Santiago Memorial Lecture. Dr. Santiago embodied the qualities of a physician scientist that we all aspire to. Fierce dedication to patients and improving their care, commitment to high quality research in both basic science and the clinical setting in order to move the field forward. He served important roles in the Washington University Diabetes Research and Training Center, building it into the successful hub of diabetes and metabolic research that it continues to be today, currently in its 45th year of continuous NIDDK funding. Dr. Santiago served as a leader in important controlled diabetes clinical trials, including the DCCT and diabetes prevention program that have yielded invaluable insights. And perhaps even more importantly, according to those who knew him best, specifically Dr. Phil Cryer, who penned a lovely tribute after Dr. Santiago's death in 1996, described him as humble, kind, a devoted friend, husband, father, and grandfather. We're fortunate to have Dr. Santiago's daughter, Teresa Santiago Turner, and her husband, Scott Turner, attending today's lecture on Zoom. So thank you both for being here. With that said, it's fitting that we are honored to have an equally dedicated and accomplished diabetes physician and researcher with us today to give this memorial lecture, Dr. Carmela Evans Molina. I feel some kinship with Dr. Evans Molina in that we have spent some time along our journeys in some of the same places. She spent her early years of training undergrad in medical school in the great state of West Virginia, where I too was born and raised. And after completing her internal medicine residency at Mass General, she completed endocrinology training at the University of Virginia and obtained a PhD in pharmacology. I too obtained a PhD in pharmacology from UVA during my time there with the MSTP. From there, I can only hope that the similarities in our careers continue. Dr. Evans Molina joined faculty at Indiana University School of Medicine in 2008, where she has built a truly awe-inspiring career. Her research program has shed light on the pathophysiology of type 1 diabetes, namely beta cell stress, ER stress, the role of circa and store operated calcium entry and beta cell function. She has embraced an omics approach in trying to understand biomarkers for predicting the development of type 1 diabetes. She has multiple RO1s, UO1s, and VA Merit Award and other funding sources. And she has also embraced clinical trial work, specifically with her involvement with the type 1 diabetes trial net and radiant. She is director of the IU Center for Diabetes and Metabolic Diseases and director of the Diabetes Research Program of the Well Center for Pediatric Research. She's involved in the NIH Integrated Islet Distribution Program, which provides human islets to researchers across the country. She's training up the next generation of physician scientists through her involvement with UI, IU's MSTP program and T32 training programs in diabetes research. And she has mentored junior faculty, postdoctoral fellows, clinical fellows, graduate, undergraduate, and even high school students in her very successful laboratory. She's received numerous well-deserved accolades, including teaching awards and research awards. Like Dr. Santiago, she is doing important editorial work for numerous journals, including diabetes. Like Dr. Santiago, she is a kind, generous, humble person. And like Dr. Santiago, she is committed to making life better for patients. As I mentioned, she works closely with TrialNet, which produced data that led to the FDA approval in November 2022 of teplizumab, a CD3 antibody, as the first disease-modifying therapy in type 1 diabetes, which delayed progression from stage 2 to stage 3 type 1 diabetes by over two years. And this is just one example of exciting treatments in a new era in type 1 diabetes management that she will share with us today. Please welcome me, please join me in welcoming Dr. Carmela Evans Molina. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that very, very kind introduction. It was really, really remarkable last night to share notes on our, uh, our common pathways. Uh, and then also to be invited here to give such a, a special um, a special lecture in honor of such a special uh, person who was part of the history here at, uh, at St. Louis. Um, so I, I, I just again want to uh, say thank you for the invitation and thank you to the family of Dr. Santiago who's uh, joining by Zoom. Uh, so as, um, as mentioned in the introduction, we're going to talk about type 1 diabetes. 
uh, today, and I wanted to start with some disclosures, which uh, so we can all get CME for being here and MOC credits. Uh, so I've served on some advisory boards related to type 1 diabetes therapeutics, had uh, some inclined research support from companies to test therapeutics in type 1 diabetes, and have had some uh, grant funding from um, uh, Lilly and Estella's uh, pharmaceuticals. My only other disclosure is that I am a beta cell biologist, as was mentioned in the uh, introduction. And it can be, uh, I think, a, a little bit uh, sort of tribal in type 1 diabetes that people love their favorite cell and they think that the pathophysiology of type 1 diabetes can be attributed exclusively to their cell of interest. Uh, so we have the, the T cell camp, the genetic camp, the environment camp, the B cells. Uh, and then sadly, Kevin Harold and Jeff Bluestone left my favorite cell off. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you the uh, perspective of type one diabetes from a beta cell biologist. And this is not at all to diminish the immuno immunology. We know that uh, people get type one diabetes because they have a uh, high genetic risk. And most of that genetic risk actually tracks to HLA uh, and other genes that uh, influence uh, their immune repertoire. Uh, but there's, I think, a really growing interest and appreciation for the role that the beta cell has in accelerating the disease process. So, um, so most definitely it is probably a combination between these two compartments, the immune system and the beta cell that allows for individuals um, to break immune tolerance and develop type one diabetes. So I know it's early, it's earlier for you than me. I'm on Eastern Standard Time, so it's actually nine-ish for me. Uh, but in case you wondered why we're talking about type one diabetes and did you happen to accidentally wander into pediatric grand rounds, one of the things that I'd love to remind the fellows um, that I have the privilege of precepting in their clinic is that um, type 1 diabetes was a it was a misnomer for a number of years that it was juvenile diabetes and thankfully we corrected that and renamed it type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes but i think there's still this perception that this is a disease of pediatrics and it is most certainly a disease of pediatrics and so this is just incidence data uh, looking across the lifespan and of course there is a peak incidence in adolescence um, but I think what is not as readily appreciated is that over half of new cases of type 1 diabetes actually occur in adults. Now, to some extent, this is because we spend longer being adults than being children. You need to add up all the, the years of adulthood, so much more than the 18 that we're, were classified as children. But I think it's really, really important to remember uh, that when you see somebody with new uh, new onset uh, diabetes, it's really important to think about the type of diabetes that they have. And this is my favorite thing to talk about with our fellows. Um, so it's really nice to go back to the beginning. And often I'm sort of met, when I ask that question, well, what type of diabetes do they have? They say, well, they have, you know, what we've documented in the past 10 notes and I cut and paste into my HPI, but, but really it's nice to go back and try to understand how they presented and, and what their features were when they developed diabetes. So uh, we, we don't do a great job of classifying uh, adults with type 1 diabetes. Probably 30 to 50% are misclassified initially. I had the uh, really nice opportunity through JDRF to work with um, IQVIA, which is a, a company, an informatics-based company, um, who have access to a lot of real-world data to understand what were some of the best predictors of somebody being misclassified or having a true diagnosis of type 1 diabetes um, and having been misclassified as, as type 2. And so these are, are somewhat, <clears throat> I think, obvious, but if you think about lean individuals, they're likely uh, less likely to have type 2 diabetes, <clears throat> although we appreciate that there is lean type 2 diabetes that we don't really understand exactly the etiology of. Younger age of onset is still going to be a little bit more predictive of type 1. People who have very high A1Cs or very high blood glucose levels um, may be more likely to have type 1. Um, so these are some of the clinical features that I think all the, the residents and learners in the audience can think about when they're going back to the beginning of how someone presented with diabetes and trying to understand what is the type of diabetes that they have. I had the opportunity to, um, through a workshop with JDRF, uh, try to to talk about adult onset type 1 diabetes and tools that we might use. So, you know, again, things to talk about age, um, other history of autoimmunity, uh, BMI, uh, background, their family history, uh, and diabetes control. Um, so these are things to sort of take with you um, from, from the lecture today. So with that behind us, I think it's really a very exciting time to be talking about type 1 diabetes, and that was alluded to in the introduction. Um, for three reasons. I'll, I'll, I kind of captured my three uh, reasons why I think it's really exciting to be talking about type 1. 
One is that in um, just a few years ago, we were able to celebrate the centennial anniversary of the discovery of insulin. Um, I have some uh, some pride in that journey, being from Indianapolis, and Eli Lilly was the first company that was able to commercialize it. Uh, but of course, this was a discovery from scientists at the University of Toronto, who were ultimately awarded the Nobel Prize for this really remarkable uh, finding. And as part of this review that we wrote, chronicling the history of, of diabetes uh, classification and type 1 diabetes, we were able to go back either through the literature or interviewing colleagues and friends and, and patients and try to understand how the management of this disease has changed over years. So um, it, it's really remarkable if you think about now the, the technology with pumps and CGM that we have access to. But not too long ago, people were still boiling, boiling their needles, sharpening their needles at home, performing kind of complicated chemistry just to get a measurement, measurement of blood glucose in their urine. Um, so it, it really has been <clears throat> remarkable over the past 100 years um, uh, uh, how the management of this disease has changed. Um, if you're a reader of the Washington Post, there was a really interesting article of Libby Lashenki, who is now 92, and um, she uh, is, is probably among some of the, the oldest individuals living with type 1, but she um, actually ended up becoming a physician, but was told that she would um, that she would be lucky to live until adolescence, and um, and she talks about her journey with type 1. Uh, so I, I would encourage somebody, if, it, if you're interested in hearing a really amazing narrative, to find this article. So the second reason it's really exciting, I think, to be talking about type 1 is because we've had this remarkable approval of the first disease-modifying therapy for type 1 diabetes. So this is tocuzumab, which is an anti-CD3-based agent. And um, this was approved just in November, November 17th. And um, as, as mentioned, this is a drug that has a fairly narrow approval. So it's for stage two type one diabetes. I'm gonna explain what that means because I think that's still a, a new concept for some people. Uh, and it is, um, the goal is to prevent the onset of stage three, which is the clinical diagnosis of uh, type one diabetes. And we'll talk about the trial that really led to, to this approval, as well as some of the challenges that we're gonna have, I think, in making sure that this drug is used in a widespread fashion. This is my second uh, sort of favorite reason uh, to be talking about type 1 diabetes or, or point of excitement. And that's because we've really, over the past 30 years, begun to understand at a much deeper level the natural history of type 1 diabetes. And um, I, I want to highlight this meta-analysis that was performed by Annette Ziegler, who is a, a, one of the world leaders in type 1 diabetes in Germany. And um, she had she accumulated data from several different birth cohort studies. So these were newborns that were identified as having high genetic risk of type 1 diabetes, largely based on their HLA, and followed over time. And so the observation from these multiple uh, birth cohort studies that were performed in North America and Europe is that by the time that an individual has two detectable autoantibodies, their risk of developing type 1 diabetes over 15 years of follow-up is a, exceeds or is close to around 80%. And so uh, this was really important information. Uh, again, these are newborns being followed, so children followed through throughout their childhood. Um, but it, it really reframed and restructured the way that we think about type 1 diabetes Previously, we all uh, had associated a diagnosis with the time that a patient came in with frank hyperglycemia, sometimes in ketoacidosis, and, um, and that's when we would say you have type 1. But these, these natural history studies have allowed us to propose a staging paradigm, which has been really helpful as we think about performing clinical trials in type 1 diabetes. And so this staging paradigm uh, is, is captured here. Essentially, we say that someone who is, has two or more autoantibodies but still has normal glucose tolerance is in stage one of uh, type 1 diabetes. If they have uh, two antibodies in the development of dysglycemia, and that's still defined as, um, as blood glucose thresholds uh, on an oral glucose tolerance test, they have progressed to stage two. And then uh, stage three is the clinical onset of type 1 diabetes. And again, this staging has been really important because it allows a regulatory path uh, to approve drugs and test drugs uh, in early stage disease. And we have really good evidence, I think, from a number of our clinical trial efforts that um, we have a much greater likelihood of success in early stage in a, as opposed to waiting until someone has stage 3 type 1 diabetes. And that's largely uh, because by the time they present in stage 3 type 1 diabetes, they've lost a significant portion of their beta cell mass. So, uh, in the uh, in this uh, across this uh, this paradigm uh, in TrialNet, which is a 
a, an international uh, type 1 diabetes trial network that includes, um, it's NIH supported, includes centers here in the US, Canada, uh, and uh, Europe and Australia. Um, we performed a, a, a study testing tuzumab, uh, which is again, this uh, T cell directed agent in high risk individuals in stage two. Uh, and so this is, has been, a, it was a very small trial, uh, it, 44 individuals in the treatment group, 32 in the placebo group. And um, they came in daily to our clinical centers and they were given this drug uh, daily for 14 days. And uh, this is the Kaplan-Meier survival curve from the original trial. Um, as you can see, these individuals in red who were the placebo group, they're at incredible risk. So they're very rapidly developing type one diabetes. Uh, but this 14 day infusion, delay the progression in the tocuzumab treated individuals. And when the original trial results were reported in 2019, uh, the median delay was about two years. Uh, so that was really, really encouraging. It took a long time to enroll this trial. It was very challenging to get people to agree uh, to come in for 14 days of infusion. It was also very challenging to identify people in this, uh, this narrow window of stage two. My colleague at IU, Emily Sims, who's uh, a, an amazing physician scientist um, who, who uh, learned basic science in her fellowship uh, in my lab, uh, has gone on to uh, analyze continued trial results from the tocuzumab treated individuals. And when she did a reanalysis of the data in uh, 2021, she found an extended median delay of about 32 and a half months. Uh, and then Emily had the, um, the really great idea because these individuals had come through our trial net network and had been going, getting re, uh, very frequent oral glucose tolerance tests to look at the changes in C-peptide prior to drug uh, therapy and then after drug therapy. And so I want to draw your attention to this period here before baseline or before enrollment in, in the, uh, the drug treatment. Um, these, and this is their C-peptide area under the curve during the oral glucose tolerance test plotted over time. Uh, and essentially, what is really remarkable is that these individuals were all declining prior to drug treatment. So uh, you can see this pattern of decline that is similar between the two groups. And then uh, tocuzumab really stabilized that C-peptide secretion. Now, it didn't reverse uh, the defects. And here she's shown the individuals who are in different glucose tolerance categories. And so the pink is dysglycemia. Uh, and essentially, these people are a bit in a suspended state. Um, so they're not normal. They don't have normal blood glucose uh, to a large extent. But they're really maintained in this dysglycemic uh, period uh, with, with stabilized C-peptide uh, values. So uh, reversing a lot, uh, improving a lot, but really not uh, completely taking away the pathophysiology that's underlying um, what is happening to these individuals. So I will say, even though that was the, the trial that led to the FDA approval, this trial has been, or this, this agent has been tested in uh, immunotherapy trials for 30 years. Or, and, and, and actually, if you look at the first, very first animal studies, they were performed in 1992. Uh, and then the first trials uh, were in the 2000s. And they were largely performed at stage three onset. So when people were diagnosed with type one diabetes, they were given this uh, therapy. Most of the trials that tested anti-CD3 based agents uh, showed an improvement in C-peptide, but no insulin independence. Um, and, and to a large extent, not really a, a significant improvement in glycemic control. And um, although we care very deeply about C-peptide as researchers uh, and beta cell biologists, patients really don't care about C-peptide. What they care about is their A1C, their glycemic variability, their, uh, their uh, lack of hypoglycemia. Um, so it wasn't really until that we had the benefit of the new staging paradigm and were able to perform a, a trial in pre-stage three or stage two um, that we were really able to show this delay. And hopefully this will be, I think, a, a real tipping point for how we perform trials in type one diabetes and really uh, engaging other companies to come into this space, which has been really underrepresented in the uh, pharmaceutical industry. So a lot of people have asked, um, small trial, the cost of this therapy is going to be about one hundred ninety-three thousand dollars. That's not going to account. Uh, that's not going to account for um, what it is likely going to cost in infusion centers, et cetera. That's just for the drug. Is it worth it? Um, I think really only someone living with type one diabetes could answer this. Uh, but I wanted to just highlight a few things. And this is a picture that um, I found on Facebook uh, of a daughter of a, a grad, uh, someone that I graduated high school with. And her mother had taken this picture. This is Hannah, and 
this is the first four months of living with type 1 diabetes for this child. These are all her needles. They were going to the biohazard drop off. And her mother took this picture of her with her because obviously this is a lot for a kid to, to kind of go through. So what does it mean to have 32 months of um, not living with type 1 diabetes? That's about 4,000 times you have to check your blood glucose, about 4,000 times that you have to inject insulin if you're using insulin in pens or needles. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a pump, you have the resources to have a pump, you have to interact with that pump about 3,000 times to dose yourself for a meal and you have to change that pump about 325 times. And if we're targeting tight blood glucose control, that individual may have about 200 hypoglycemic events. Um, so I think the math really does support even uh, a delay of three years, especially if you think about very young children, uh, kids that are in college, and the challenges uh, that, we, that they are gonna have at different parts of their life. So, um, what we found uh, in, the drugs, in the drug treatment uh, study is that results were somewhat heterogeneous. And um, obviously I think that within TrialNet, we've thought about this as, uh, a, as sort of a branch point for the way that we design and think about additional trials. Um, one of the really uh, very interesting things that came from a, a pre-specified subgroup analysis is that the drug was actually more efficacious in people who had worse beta cell function at the time that they enrolled in the study. And this was really quite counterintuitive to what we might have predicted. We would have thought that people who had better C-peptide, more beta cell mass would be primed to respond better. Um, but really the opposite is what we found. Uh, these are the Kaplan-Meier survival curves if your A1C for C-peptide was above or below the median. And you can see on the far right that if your uh, C-peptide area on this curve was below the median, you had a much better response uh, to drug therapy. And that was independent of age, which we know is a really important uh, modifier for, for response to therapy. So this observation, and I don't have time to show you uh, results from the oral insulin study, uh, really was, uh, has, has kind of developed, it, it's made us develop a new hypothesis for how we think about um, the right time to target interventions. Um, it, although I can't show you all the data from the oral insulin study, which was overall negative, so oral insulin was not able to prevent the onset of, um, of having multiple autoantibodies to stage three diagnosis, we found that people with a lower beta cell function actually did have a response. Uh, so this has led to this idea that there is a therapeutic window of opportunity where people are uh, most uh, likely to derive a benefit from an immune intervention. And um, what I wanna talk to you about for the rest of the, uh, our time together this, this morning is really thinking about the beta cell as an anchor for identifying and leveraging this window of opportunity. Uh, we're not going to talk about the idea that we probably should be testing combination approaches in type 1 diabetes. It's something that we have not uh, been very good about doing, and I think largely that's because endocrinologists as a group uh, are a bit risk averse. Uh, so we, I think, need to challenge ourselves and uh, think about how we can combine agents, um, how we might use things like platform studies to, uh, to test agents in rapid succession. Uh, and then, um, but what I do want to spend some time talking about today is the idea that we can use the beta cell as an anchor for identifying biomarkers that can help, help us either understand the underlying pathophysiology or can help us with risk stratification. So really, um, I'm going to share a, a bit of data from my own lab and, and talk about uh, some of our work to identify temporal biomarkers of beta cell stress. And then um, that's going to focus on uh, this, uh, this target that we've identified, PDIA1. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about pro-insulin, which is one of my favorite biomarkers, uh, and then link that with some of the basic science work that we've been interested in in the lab studying calcium signaling in the beta cell. So um, this is a point where I admit that I'm really very jealous of the immunologists because they can take a blood sample and they can do lots of fancy flow cytometry and they can um, really drill down on uh, stage-specific immune signatures. And this is a... Um, a review article from Jane Buckter's uh, group. She's at the Benaroya, and she's really been able to, through a lot of really uh, beautiful, elegant work, identify these um, different immune signatures across stages of type 1 diabetes. Um, but we don't have the luxury of being able to do that uh, with the beta cell because we're really relying on something that might be secreted by the beta cell because we all know that you should not biopsy uh, the pancreas, even though that has been trialed, tried in a European study and it, it didn't really end well. Um, but with that context in mind, uh, I wanted to highlight a study performed by Farouk Syed in my group. He's a, a really talented research assistant professor 
And Farouk was really interested in um, trying to use omics approaches to identify biomarkers of beta cell stress. And uh, in many times in our lab, we use different model systems to build towards uh, clinical translation. And um, what Farouk did is he isolated islets from our really our, our, our sort of best mouse model of type 1 diabetes, which is the NAD mouse. Uh, we can argue about how great that mouse model is, but it is really kind of the only one that we have that, uh, that recapitulates this, uh, this slow progression to, to diabetes. But Farouk took mice that um, were at different weeks of age uh, and then at diabetes onset. And in our, um, in our animal facility, probably about 80% of our mice uh, develop type 1 diabetes by at least 20 to 22 weeks of age. Uh, so Farouk took islets from NOD mice. These were female mice uh, because the male mice are less affected. Um, and then um, performed proteomics using the isolated islets. He also looked at a group of mice that were remain diabetes free uh, because we thought they, that could tell us something really important about the beta cell and uh, adaptation to stress. And then he compared results to um, mice that had been rendered diabetic acutely with adoptive transfer. And I wanted to highlight just a few of his findings um, from a recent paper. So when we looked at the, uh, specifically in the NOD, the longitudinal NOD cohort uh, and, um, and looked at pathways that were modulated, uh, we really settled on uh, the identification of a number of stress pathways that seem to impact mitochondrial function and ER function. And that was not a new discovery. Many people have been studying beta cell ER stress in the context of disease activation, uh, but really what we saw was, um, I think had mirrored a lot of those results. That there was this time dependent uh, signature of activation of the unfolded protein response in ER stress. And this was really interesting to us because um, the idea that many people have been interested in is that there is really this intersection between uh, th the beta cell stress pathways and immune activation. And in, a, in addition to ER stress, a number of other pathways have been identified, things like senescence, um, there's HLA class 1 overexpression in type 1 diabetes, uh, there is uh, upregulation of uh, microRNAs that are secreted in exosomes that are, have been shown to interact with the immune system. Um, but there's really quite a bit of data suggesting that ER stress within the beta cell might make the, the beta cell more immunogenic. And some of this data includes work by Duffy Ozeri linking uh, pro-inflammatory pro cytokines with actual ER stress activation and HLA class 1 overexpression. Uh, there's also been a, a really nice uh, uh, body of work showing that ER stress may cause the beta cell to produce new antigens. Um, that's work, I, I think, uh, also done largely in Desio's group and then with Bart Roque. Um, and that's via alternative splicing as well as altered translation of insulin mRNA. And then a number of uh, enzymes that cause post-translational modifications, including citrullinization, um, have been shown to be activated by ER stress as well. And then on the immunology side, um, they've uh, developed really, I think, what are, are just beautiful assays to be able to say that a, a specific T cell clone is reactive against some of these new antigens. So I think a growing body of evidence suggesting that um, it's not only beta cell homicide, uh, but perhaps the beta cell is uh, contributing uh, to disease activation, uh, the concept of, um, of suicide. It's the homicide suicide. Uh, kind of uh, debate that's been going on for a number of years in the field. So when we looked at some of the particular proteins that were changed uh, temporally in our NOD mouse model, uh, a pattern caught our eye. It was a caught, it caught my eye, uh, and and that's probably because I think if you're um, if you have a hammer, everything's a nail uh, for me. And I was looking at um, I was looking at these these heat maps, and you know when you when make studies, you're always trying to find some sort of pattern to uh, to go after, and what caught my eye is that um, when I thought about the clinical progression of these individuals in, in, um, in trial mat, if you look very closely at their C-peptide secretion characteristics, the beta cell is trying in a very heroic effort to maintain glycemia by increasing insulin output to um, as long as it can do that until it's, everything sort of falls off the cliff and it can no longer adapt. And really that's quite similar to what we see in type 2 diabetes to a large extent as well. Um, and this is just C peptide area under the curve plotted longitudinally in individuals who are followed for a long period of time uh, in, in our trial net um, program. And so when I looked at these heat maps, I was struck that there were a number of protective proteins that were um, 
things that had been ID identified as being protective against ER and oxidative stress that followed a similar pattern, meaning that they were upregulated to a certain extent. And then at about 14 weeks in these mice, they seemed to lose their expression uh, in, in, um, and that coincided with disease progression. And there was one protein in particular, PDI1, which caught our attention. And um, that was because it had a connection with proinsulin, which we had been studying in, a, in some of our different uh, projects as well. Um, so we wanted to, to take a closer look at PDI1, which again showed this temporal upregulation and then loss at the time of diabetes. Um, we were able to obtain uh, samples from the NPOD uh, biorepository. And so this is a biorepository that contains um, pancreatic infections from organ donors who have type 1 diabetes. And then um, really in a, in a remarkable program, we're able to screen organ donors for autoantibodies. So we've been able to identify um, a small number of uh, individuals who um, have autoantibodies that have not progressed to type 1 diabetes. And so that hit rate is really 2 to 3%. So it takes a lot of screening to identify these organ donors, but they've taught us a lot about those early stages of disease at the level of the pancreas. So we looked at PDI1 expression over time, and we saw really something similar uh, in these pancreatic sections from organ donors, as we had seen in the mass sec. Um, that there was this upregulation and then eventual loss of PDI1 expression. And again, uh, we focused on this protein because there was a, a really nice body of evidence suggesting that it played an important role in the beta cell's ability to uh, secrete insulin. And in particular, uh, it's a thiol uh, oxidoreductase. It's very highly expressed in the ER. And uh, Randall Kaufman's group had shown that if you knock out this protein in the beta, in the beta cell, um, that there is pro-insulin uh, um, accumulation. So insulin, of course, is processed from pre-pro-insulin to pro-insulin uh, to these intermediates and then into insulin and C-peptide. And this is regulated sequentially in the secretory pathway um, within the ER, um, that first modification into pro-insulin, and then uh, sequential processing in the, in the Golgi, and then ultimately the cleavage into C-peptide and insulin in the secretory granules. And so when he, uh, Randall's group, knocked this out, um, the mice uh, that were fed a high-fat diet, um, actually this is data from the regular chow uh, animals, uh, they had glucose intolerance and they had pro-insulin accumulation. Um, so this suggested this protein was really important uh, for pro-insulin maturation in the beta cell. And this caught our attention because for a number of years, we had been thinking about pro-insulin as, um, as, as an assay for ER function uh, or an assay for beta cell stress. So if you have an unhappy secretory pathway in the beta cell, uh, you are not going to be able to efficiently process pro-insulin and you secrete more pro-insulin relative to the amount of C-peptide um, that is secreted. And again, in a study that Emily and I did uh, now a number of years ago in 2016, we had, uh, done a next case control analysis and uh, pathway to prevention uh, samples. Again, these are individuals identified as autoantibody positive who were followed in uh, trial net. We had asked for samples about a year before they developed uh, diabetes. And we looked across three age groups uh, and we compared progressors to diabetes to non-progressors. And we were really interested to understand if pro-insulin might predict the onset of type one diabetes. We looked specifically at their pro-insulin to C-peptide ratios. So when you looked at the um, at the the entire cohort and did a lo logistic regression analysis, you did have an increased odds of progression if your uh, pro-insulin to C-peptide ratio was higher. Uh, and then we looked uh, more closely among very young children, children who are in this adolescent age range, and then older individuals. Um, now, uh, this is just a log log logistic regression analysis. Um, this is the analysis if you look at the individuals who are broken down by age groups. And I want to point out a few things. One, uh, this is likely not going to be a very good biomarker in adolescents where there's a fair amount of insulin resistance. Um, we really didn't see a difference in pro insulin to peptide ratios between those groups. And it might not work very well in adults either. I think we, we probably need to study that with a larger group of individuals. Um, but really, the, the group that was driving our differences were these very young children who we think have a more aggressive course of type 1 diabetes. Um, so that makes some sense that they may have more beta cell stress. Um, and specifically, if you looked at these individuals who are progressing, if you were in the highest quartile of the pro-insulin to C-peptide ratio, um, you had about a 90% chance of developing type 1 diabetes. 
And Carlin's own C-peptide was more predictive than if you just simply looked at C-peptide alone. So that was one reason that we were really quite interested in Carlin's one as a biomarker and the idea that PDI1 might also offer some, uh, some insight into the health status of the beta cell during diabetes progression. Now, the other reason we were interested in this is that we had, had an opportunity to collaborate with Mark Manuel's group. Uh, he's at Yale. He's an immunologist. And he had been very interested in PDIA1 and had identified that there were measurable antibodies to PDIA1 in individuals with type 1 diabetes. And so these are some of his results. He developed this assay to measure anti PDIA1 antibodies. Uh, and, and you can see that they're elevated in individuals who have established an early onset type 1 diabetes compared to healthy individuals. So this suggested to us that this protein was upregulated in the beta cell, but somehow the immune system is detecting this upregulation perhaps, and um, there is, a, um, there is a, an immune response against this uh, protein. So uh, what Farouk did next is develop an assay to be able to measure this in the circulation. Uh, we went back to those original NOD mice, and you can see that there is some elevation at different points in time uh, in the NOD mouse models. Most, uh, dramatically at week 10 and week 14. Uh, at the time of diabetes where there is a loss of beta cell mass, uh, we don't see differences. Um, but we were able to then also use this assay in a small cohort of individuals from our local type 1 diabetes biorepository, where at our children's hospital um, at Riley, we try to approach children who have uh, developed type 1 diabetes and ask if they would be willing to um, provide a, a urine sample and a blood sample to us to store away for some of our assay studies. Um, so when we, when we went to that uh, biorepository and compared individuals who um, had been diagnosed with diabetes roughly within 48 hours, and then uh, age, BMI category, and uh, sex match controls, we did see an increase uh, in, in circulating levels of PDI1. So just to, to finish this, uh, this one vignette, uh, so I think really we uh, have this idea that we're, we're trying to identify this period of accelerated active disease in type 1 diabetes. We're, we're going to need better biomarkers to do that, and I think that's going to be a combination of immune and beta cell biomarkers. And then um, there's lots of data suggesting that ER stress plays a prominent role uh, in, um, in the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes, and we've been very interested in how we can leverage activation of ER stress to identify biomarkers of beta cell health. So um, I want to shift gears uh, and tell you a, a short second vignette, and now really focusing back on proinsulin and trying to understand the, the mechanism of impaired proinsulin processing in a beta cell. And um, as introduced in, um, at the beginning of the, the talk, I'm, I'm really interested in calcium signaling in the beta cell and the basic science side. Um, so for a number of years, we've been uh, testing the hypothesis that dysregulation of calcium within the secretory pathway thinking about the ER and the Golgi and the granules, leads to uh, stress in the beta cell uh, that's linked with the activation of uh, organelle-specific stress, like ER stress and Golgi stress, and, uh, and also diminishes insulin secretion and production. And really, there's a, a number of reasons why calcium is important within this, uh, pa this pathway of the cell. Um, it's important cofactor for chaperones and foldases, regulates protein processing within the Golgi, and is actually a cofactor for enzymes that are involved in proinsulin processing. Uh, and so we've studied a number of different components of uh, the molecular machinery that regulate calcium, uh, most specifically in the ER. We have done some Golgi-related uh, work. Um, but over the years, we've um, shown a role for dysregulated ER calcium release from the ryanodine receptor. Uh, we've looked at um, impairments in star-operated calcium entry and how they impact beta cell function. Um, but our, our first love in this uh, field has been the circa pump. And this is a P-type APPase that, uh, that transports calcium from the cytosol into the ER. And um, a number of years ago, we showed that if you um, had a haploinsufficient model of circa 2 um, and fed these mice high-fat diet, um, which was more of a model of type 2 diabetes, uh, they had glucose intolerance and impaired calcium uptake. Um, but while we were performing these studies, there was all this data suggesting that there was um, really this in, important role for ER stress in type 1 diabetes pathogenesis, which uh, led to a number of questions focused on dysregulation of circa uh, in type 1 diabetes. So one of the really interesting findings from uh, this early study in 2016 is that these mice also had really elevated proinsulin levels. 
Um, so for us, this was a great model to be able to try to understand what some of the, uh, the pathways that led to impaired chromosome processing might be. And so um, very quickly, I want to share a few pieces of data. Um, Hitoshi and Tatsu in my lab uh, went on to develop a beta cell specific mouse model of circuitry deficiency. These mice have mild glucose intolerance if you age them, and this is without any stress, uh, just uh, letting them age in our vivarium. Um, and they have this glucose intolerance, but really no change in insulin sensitivity. Um, but what is more, I think, uh, more interesting about this mouse model uh, is that they have this really uh, interesting and, and striking upregulation of proinsulin. So uh, if you look just at uh, proinsulin levels in the serum or the pancreas, and if you look at the ratio of proinsulin to insulin, there is this marked upregulation of the proinsulin to insulin ratio in the serum and whole pancreas of these mice. Um, and then uh, I think that the immunofluorescence uh, shows that there is um, this accumulation of proinsulin. Um, so this opened up a really nice avenue for us to understand why proinsulin processing is impaired. So we validated that activity of the two main enzymes that are responsible for proinsulin processing, PC13 and PC2, were down. Um, here we use an in vitro cell model of um, it's an insulin or rat insulinoma cell line that we've used uh, CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out circa, and we're able to work with Iris Lindberg, who's studied these processing enzymes for a number of years to measure enzyme activity, uh, and they are uh, markedly downregulated with uh, circuit efficiency. If we overexpress circa, we can partially rescue them. And then we had, for a number of years, been using things like cytokines to model type 1 diabetes. And um, we thought, well, maybe there's just a loss of expression of the mRNA of these processing enzymes. And that's what we see if we take islets and we treat them with pro-inflammatory cytokines. That data is shown here. It was, uh, these are experiments performed again by Farouk. Um, but when we looked at our gene expression levels, they really were no different for the, the main uh, pro-inflammatory processing enzymes. So we looked at all three here, um, PC13, PC2, and CPE. And that took us to the literature and lots of discussions with Iris. And, um, and what we learned was, I think, some really beautiful cell biology about how these pro-hormone convertases are regulated both temporally and spatially within the circuitry pathway. And so these um, are zymogens that um, are, are, are synthesized at these larger precursor forms. And then sequentially within the ER and the Golgi and the granules, uh, they're activated, they're cleaved and activated. And so you can really, um, infer quite a bit about their activity by looking at these most active forms or these least active forms. And so um, when we took this concept into our mouse model, uh, this is a busy slide and I just want to point out a couple things. Um, so this is, is sort of the molecular weight of the most active forms of the enzymes versus the least active. But really what we saw is there was a pattern of reduced expression of the most active forms of the of PC13 and PC2. Uh, and in, in the case of PC2, an upregulation of a proform um, that, that had reduced activity. Um, so this suggested to us that there was some sort of defect in processing of these enzymes that was also closely linked to impaired processing of proinsulin. So when you don't really have um, a, a kind of preset uh, understanding or, or mechanism in mind. Uh, we use things like proteomics and RNA-seq again to try to understand what pathways may be upregulated. And when we did um, RNA-seq of our islets and then proteomics of the cell line, what we were struck by is this marked upregulation or modulation of pathways that, del um, that pointed us to a trafficking defect. And um, to understand this a little bit more in detail, uh, we took islets that were wild type treated with Grafeldin A, and this is an inhibitor of trafficking within the circulatory pathway. And what we could find is that we could recapitulate at least some of the changes in the pattern of expression of these processing enzymes, suggesting to us again that there might be um, some defect in trafficking. And then, of course, when we went back and looked at, with immunofluorescence to more closely uh, look at the compartmentalization of proinsulin, and, and we've done this now with the processing enzymes, what we see is that there is an upregulation or a, an accumulation, uh, if you will, of proinsulin within um, an intermediate compartment between the ER and the Golgi called the ergot compartment. That's marked by this, um, this protein LMAUNN, and then also uh, some accumulation of proinsulin in the cis Golgi as well. And so the model that we're trying to test now is how trafficking of these uh, prohormones and um, 
including proinsulin in the processing enzyme is impacted when you have ER stress and calcium dysregulation. So this is really just the conclusion um, that we have this loss of ER calcium with circuit two knockout, de decreased vesicle trafficking, this maturation defect, and that leads to impaired proinsulin biogenesis and trafficking. So does this have any clinical relevance? Um, to be honest, I don't know, um, but I wanna share just one more uh, clinical study with you. And again, this is on the topic of proinsulin, which we've been, we've been sort of obsessed with for a number of years. Um, but we um, had looked in this pre-type 1 diabetes uh, uh, cohort or, or early stage, and we wanted to then ask a similar question in individuals who'd had uh, type 1 diabetes for a long period of time. And for, for this study, we were able to um, obtain samples from the type 1 diabetes exchange study. And these are individuals who'd had type 1 diabetes for a number of years. So about, uh, on average, about 13 and a half years. Um, they were older individuals. And um, we worked closely with some co uh, colleagues at the Benalea Research Institute. And we, again, assayed uh, proinsulin. And we had the benefit of their C-peptide status from the parent study. Um, and what was surprising to us, um, we, we, this was very unexpected. So when we thought about the people who had residual C-peptide, we thought maybe they'll have some increased proinsulin because they probably have some beta cell stress. Um, but what was uh, more surprising to us is that the people that were functionally C-peptide negative, um, so they had no detectable C-peptide, still had detectable proinsulin in their serum. So about 90% of those individuals, you could measure proinsulin, but you could not measure uh, C-peptide in their, in their blood. And that was either if you looked fasting or um, after a meal stimulation. And then um, we, we looked at a different question, and, and this was also puzzling to us. And every time we tried to explain it to the reviewers of the paper, nobody liked uh, any of our explanations, but I'll, I'll present it as an exploratory uh, hypothesis here. So we looked at the delta of the proinsulin from the fasting to the 90-minute stimulated value. These are non-diabetic individuals here. So if, if you don't have diabetes and you ate your kolache dough ball, um, you have a really high increase in your proinsulin uh, from fasting to following a meal stimulation. Um, and that's what the beta cell should be doing normally. If you have um, some residual C-peptide in, in type 1 diabetes, you also have a measurable delta of proinsulin. Um, but if you have really the intermediate or very or undetectable C-peptide, there was no delta. Um, and for a cell that should be nutrient stimulated, this is an abnormal response. It would suggest perhaps that proinsulin is not exiting the cell in a regula regulated manner. Um, it may not, not be even coming out of the cell via the secretory granules. So um, we are now trying to um, build some data to, to study the idea that maybe proinsulin is, is leaking passively through the cell or being sent into the endolysosomal system via release from the exosomes, and that may be interacting with the, uh, the immune system uh, because we know that insulin, proinsulin are very important antigens in type 1 diabetes. So we're using some of our mouse models to be able to, um, to test these hypotheses. Um, and just one piece of data to suggest that there may be some validity to our hypothesis. So we took our haploinsufficient mouse uh, uh, for circa, painfully backcrossed it onto the NOD background, um, and then we looked at diabetes onset. Uh, and these mice had accelerated diabetes. Uh, so the average onset for our haploinsufficient mouse was about 14 and a half weeks, and the average for the wild type was about 19 weeks, suggesting that if you lose circuit in the, um, it, at this point, these are in all cells. So that is something that we need to, to further extend our studies both to the immune function. Um, but if you, um, you, you have less circuit in the beta cell, um, there, that may contribute to accelerated diabetes onset. And then really uh, in a, a satisfying sort of phenocopy of this, um, of this mouse model, um, I've been able to recently collaborate with a dermatologist in Sweden who's been accumulating cohorts of individuals who have circuit two haploinsufficiency and they have a disease called Jerry White syndrome. And they primarily have this ichthyosis. Um, but um, when uh, Dr. Wickstrom, who's the dermatologist, looked very closely at the incidence of diabetes in his uh, cohort of individuals with Jerry White, he found that they did have an increased risk of type one diabetes, um, but not type two diabetes. So, so that is a, a something really interesting that we hope we might be able to correlate with our mouse studies. So really just to, um, to summarize where we are, uh, I think it's a very exciting time in type 1 diabetes. I kind of shared my three highlights with you. Um, but you know, arguably, I think the fact that we now have a, our first disease modifying therapy 
after 30 long years of, uh, of trials uh, is exciting. Um, I don't want to minimize how challenging it's going to be to find individuals who have stage type 1 diabetes. Uh, I think we have to think about how we're going to screen individuals. Uh, this now becomes something that we're going to have to work, work on a public health basis uh, to, to identify these individuals and then develop really what are the best strategies for screening and monitoring. Um, it's going to be challenging to get something uh, to people that requires a daily infusion. Uh, but again, I'm very hopeful that uh, this is an important tipping point. Uh, we often are faced when we have discussions with drug companies um, who have immunomodulatory therapies in other disease spaces like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis, there's a, a, some, a, to some extent some hesitation to enter type 1 diabetes. And that's probably because for 30 years we performed clinical trials that showed moderate benefit, but really not a home run. Um, we know that we need better biomarkers to guide our interventions in the stratification. And then again, even for the learners and the, and the very experienced and older people that I'm, I actually now count myself in that category, always ask yourself, what type of diabetes does this person have? Go back to the beginning and ask them how they presented. And sometimes I think you'll find a very, um, a very compelling reason that they may have been misclassified uh, for, for years. Um, and that really does have important impacts on how we manage these individuals. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the members of my lab. Um, I've shown data and, and tried to highlight their contributions with pictures. It's really I have an incredible group of people that I have an honor to work with at IU. So uh, Hitoshi and Tatsu led the, um, the SERPA knockout study. Uh, Rob uh, is the poor, poor soul in the lab that had the back crosses in OB mice. Um, Farouk is somebody who has his hands in all the different projects in the lab. Uh, and I, I've been able to show you some of their data thanks to our funders and then some of the networks that we're part of. And then collaborators, uh, really Iris Lindbergh has uh, played such an important role in helping me understand um, the processing of these enzymes. Uh, and then lots of other people have contributed to lots of, uh, of our projects as well. And then I have to say a thank you to Crown Up for this next. And then I think I'm supposed to show the, the theme in the middle here. Talk. I think we have time uh, for a few questions. Janet, and I would like to introduce Dr. Janet Lee, who's our new division chief for pulmonary and critical care medicine. So for those of you who haven't met her yet, here she is. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so those, yes, for, for Zoom. Okay, so uh, Dr. Lee was asking a question about um, immune checkpoint inhibitors, which um, have been, I, I think, just a remarkable story to follow, that when you unlicense the immune system, preferably against the immune cell, or the cancer cells, rather, uh, a bystander has been many of our endocrine organs. And there are these now these cases of type 1 diabetes. Um, and those cases are really interesting. They're, they're quite fulminant uh, in presentation. And so they sometimes have, people are beginning to study them in different cohorts and, and accumulate cases to try to understand their, their, uh, the function, their, their phenotypes. They may or may not have autoantibodies. And I think that probably reflects the, the really rapid nature of the disease, and they usually very quickly develop hyperglycemia. So I think they're very interesting, but they, I think they are teaching us some things that, um, some lessons that we can take. One of the really prominent signatures in the tocilizumab studies is a, is a state of T-cell exhaustion. And I think that, that sort of is a, 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 a almost mirror image, or, or not mirror image, but you know, 180 degrees from what we might see in those, the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, where there's this marked T-cell activation. Um, uh, and, and so I think the other potential is that I know there are companies who are developing uh, compounds that might serve as agonist of these uh, pathways, this PD, PD-1, PD-L1 interaction. PD-L1 is expressed on the beta cell and then uh, PD-1 on, on immune activated immune cells. So 
there's this idea that we might do the reverse and that might have some efficacy in autoimmunity and, and potentially type one diabetes. But I think that's really all very speculative. Obviously the question that we have to think about is, well, uh, would we then cause people to be more susceptible to cancer or have a higher incidence of cancer if you're modulating that pathway? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. Maybe, um, yeah, so uh, Dr. McGill is asking about LADA. Uh, so that stands for latent autoimmune diabetes of the adults. Uh, maybe unpopular opinion. I, I actually have banned that use of that word in my clinic uh, with my fellows. Uh, I think you either have autoimmunity or you don't. Uh, and that you, if you develop autoimmunity as an adult, yes, you may have a very prolonged course before you become markedly dysglycemic and, and diabetic. So are they different? I don't think LADA are different than people who have type 1 diabetes. Everybody just comes to the party at a different time. Uh, so I think that one thing that we've not done well in our cohorts of um, like trial net is to understand survivors. Uh, and so we've been uh, becoming a bit more interested in the what I've been sort of terming these uh, slow progressors or long-term no progress, uh, long-term non-progressors, so people who are, survive autoantibody positivity for a long period of time, um, somewhat like that NOD group that we let age that were diabetes resistant. I think we could probably learn a lot from the um, the pathways that lead to tolerance in the in the setting of this activation, um, and and maybe even beta cell pathways that allow somebody to not progress to diabetes. So I think that there are lessons to be learned. Um, but but I, um, I I don't know that I consider a lot of to be any different than somebody with autoimmunity. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, well, you know, there are, so when you start to look at these people in trial net, and we discard them because we don't want to put them in trials, but there are people who have been studied for 10, 11 years with autoantibody positive. They come in, they get their oral glucose tolerance test. So I think it's a real, a wealth of data that we've probably not adequately tapped into. Yes. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And um, and we we started to try to think about that in our, if we knock down circa, for example, in, um, we were trying to do it in some pituitary cells to see if we might see that same defect in trafficking of important hormones through the secretory pathways that can serve across different cell types. Um, there are people who have mutations in CC13 and CC2. They have a lot of pro-insulin, as you might imagine. But I think their dominant phenotype is obesity because they are, there's uh, impaired processing of hormones like POMC, uh, which regulate appetite. Um, but then I think at dinner last night, we were talking about that interesting case that you guys had where there was pituitary dysfunction in type 1 diabetes. So that got me thinking along the same lines as your question as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.